WQEX thanks those who have made broadcast of this program possible, our members, and... Blue Cross of Western Pennsylvania and Pennsylvania Blue Shield are pleased to support AgeWise in the interest of better health for area seniors. And Integra Bank, serving the communities of Western Pennsylvania for more than 130 years, offering classic choice, a variety of financial services for active savers and investors. Integra Bank, because you want more from your life and more from your bank. The bank for times like these. And by St. Margaret Memorial Hospital, enriching the lives of seniors and their families. If you're older, you're in capable hands at St. Margaret. For more information, call 784-4144. Hi, I'm Ellen Ruscino. You know, the National Institute of Health reports that more than four out of every five men between the ages of 50 and 60 have benign enlargement of the prostate gland. However, only about one in 10 of them will need a surgical procedure to relieve the problem. The real problem is too many men are embarrassed and afraid to do what's necessary to protect themselves. Now, what is benign prostate enlargement? What causes it? How is it cured? Well, football Hall of Famer Johnny Unitas has first-hand experience, and you're going to hear his story tonight. You'll also get the opportunity to talk to a doctor anonymously to get all of your questions answered about prostate enlargement. That's all coming up on this special one-hour edition of AgeWise Weekly. might be experiencing some symptoms that make you wonder whether you are suffering from prostate enlargement. A lot of you, if you are typical of many men, are perhaps a little hesitant to, to uh, go to the doctor to find out. Well, to help you determine whether you should seek medical advice, we've put together a piece of video that will explain exactly what we're talking about. The prostate gland is a gland that sits uh, around the urethra, which is the opening where urine comes out in a man. And the prostate is important in making secretions, uh, particularly to uh, uh, make secretions for lubrication for uh, sperm, um, sexual functions uh, as well. And the prostate uh, grows as you get older. All men being different, uh, this will occur at different rates in different people. I'd say 70% uh, of uh, men uh, probably in the world uh, have this uh, problem uh, that becomes symptomatic and probably 98% of uh, men after they get to be 30, 40 years of age will have start having enlargement of the prostate. It's such a natural process and just happens with uh, uh, with all people. Usually you'll get a change in uh, urinary uh, habits. Uh, that's the most frequent uh, cause uh, of, of, um, of symptoms uh, that men know that they're starting to have prosthetic problems. And usually this will occur in the 50 to 60 year age group. Symptoms will uh, consist of an increasing uh, frequency of urination, uh, some slowing of the stream, maybe getting up uh, more at night, uh, all the way to uh, having urinary infections or blood in their urine, so that these are all signs and symptoms related to uh, prostate enlargement. 
Occasionally, if there's infection uh, or if a patient will develop a bladder stone, these can be painful situations, but pain is not one of the hallmarks of prostate enlargement. It's usually the change in urinary symptoms uh, uh, that occurs. There is a, a big factor of embarrassment, and a lot of men don't like the uh, e exam, which consists of a, uh, a digital rectal exam. They find it embarrassing, and uh, uh, some have great fear uh, of just the process of going through this. I'm Eleanor Shano, and uh, welcome to AgeWise Weekly. We are joined now in the studio with one of the city's most prominent urologists. His name is Dr. James McCaig. Dr. McCaig is associated with Mercy Hospital. He is going to be here in the studio for the next hour to answer any questions you have about prostate enlargement, about prostate cancer. Our phone lines are open, 683-1600. Doctor, I want to welcome you. Uh, in that piece of video, those statistics are startling. Did I hear 98% of all men over the age of 35 have some form of prostate enlargement? I think that's accurate, too. The, um, the tendency to get prostatic enlargement is determined primarily by hormonal imbalances. Mm -hmm. As the prostatic tissue is stimulated by male hormones, and perhaps by some minor female hormone component, the prostatic tissue enlarges. The prostate is built like a donut, and an adult male passes urine through the hole in the donut. And as the donut gets bigger, the hole in the donut gets smaller, so that the bladder has to struggle and work harder to empty. How serious is this problem? Well, it varies. It, uh, generally, the bladder can adapt. Mm -hmm. uh, the tendency is for the bladder to get thicker and a bit stronger. The muscle fibers in, a, in any muscle that's a, asked to work harder get thicker like a weightlifter's arm. The next thing that happens is that the fibers shorten. And that's the reason that weightlifters don't straighten out their elbows. They've, mm -hmm. they've got a, a, a muscle that is thickened and shortened and is able to generate a little bit higher pressure so that it's able to generally overcome the obstruction and consequently the, the more narrow the channel the stronger the bladder usually gets. When it doesn't get as strong and can't adapt to that narrowness, then the fellow gets symptomatic. Are all men at risk? Or are some men more at risk? I think as a general rule, all men are at risk. Uh, if, you, if you don't have normal hormone levels, you're at less risk. As you get older, does the condition worsen? Uh, if 98% if of all the men over the age of 35 have some degree of prostate enlargement, what happens when men get to be 60, 65, and older? I think they begin to show their symptoms more. Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, the symptoms tend to gradually Im increase with age. And when you see the, 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 the surgical results, for example, where the, the fellows who are having surgery tend to be older men, I think that the, the, the symptoms, by definition, are probably a little bit more prominent and maybe a little bit more annoying. There's some other factors as well, and the, the prominent one is that as you get older and as other systems begin to give you trouble, the inactivity that it causes, that, that are, the inactivity caused by those, those problems, if you go into the hospital with a broken leg, if you go into the hospital with congestive heart failure, all of those things ask your urinary tract to do more. Mm -hmm. And then the problem arises that you now have more problems simply because you're asking that system to do more work. Okay, let's run down the symptoms again. I, I know we, we went through them briefly in that, that uh, video presentation, but run down the most common symptoms. Well, the symptoms are consistent with a narrow channel. Uh, the first thing that happens is that the tendency is for the stream to get a little bit more narrow, uh, for the, the fellow to, to experience more work in emptying his bladder so that he strains more to void. Mm -hmm. He may empty his bladder less efficiently, or he may notice that the bladder is getting smaller in order to adapt to the narrowness of the channel so that he may start having more frequency at night. He may be getting up more at night than he used to. Uh, he may find that is also true during the day. Um, and then the symptoms can become more prominent because of the side effects of not 
having successful bladder emptying. You can get bladder stones, you can get infection, you can get... But doctor, a lot of those things uh, men might just attribute to, to growing older, uh, more frequent urination, getting up during the night, a little bit of discomfort, and they say, well, that's just a sign of, of getting older. Well, there, there, there's some truth to that, um, but there are always reasons. For example, a man in heart failure uh, who does not get fluid out of his system very well, when he lies down at night, he has more fluid in his system that he gets rid of so that he starts getting up at night because he's got, he's got frequency because his bladder is being given more fluid. That's a fellow who has frequency at night, not because he's got prostatic problems, but because he's in heart failure. Okay, There's always you. a reason. We're doing this show tonight because we know that, that men uh, are frequently frightened. Uh, men uh, hesitate to, to go to a doctor. They have concerns. They have questions. And we've opened our phone lines to all of you men out there, 683-1600. And we're going to take a call right now. Caller, line 7, you're on the air. Uh, good evening, doctor. Um, I was just, uh, I was wondering if I had uh, somewhat related, you know, uh, problem as far as the prostate was concerned. Um, the, there is an organ uh, right above the, the testicle. I believe it maybe makes the uh, sperm or whatever it does, but that seems on me to be enlarging and I am a little bit sore. Uh, I know I should contact a urologist, but I was just, when I heard that 30-year-old statistic, I was kind of wondering, you know, what, what's going on? Is it a prostate problem? I don't know. And there does seem to be a little bit of soreness in the bottom of my stomach, one on each side of it. The testicle has a, um, a loading dock for sperm called the epididymis, and it sits behind the testicle. It has a tremendous surface area. Uh, if you get any irritation there, a minor irritation gives you a tremendous result of, of inflammatory change. Um, in a young guy, that's much more likely the cause than, than in somebody who's older. Um, older men can get the same type of irritation and inflammation and actually can work that infection down from the prostate to the, the epididymis. But in younger men, that kind of irritation is much more likely to be inflammatory, particularly in men who do heavy work. So it's, uh, it's an important consideration for your comfort. The other important thing is that younger men have more chance, have a more, have a greater chance of having a carcinoma of the testicle, a tumor of the testicle, and any time you have a swelling, you really should have a good explanation for that. So actually, what I'm hearing is this gentleman should make an appointment with. Yeah, with I, the I think it's, rude, it's worth. What uh, at what age should uh, a man begin to have regular prostate exams? Well, is this part of a normal physical examination? It, it should be, and I think generally is. There are there are really two entities here in this age group that are of importance. The first is benign prostatic enlargement. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the donut gets bigger right. and the hole in the donut gets smaller and that happens to every single male to some okay, degree. Okay, and as a layperson, this doesn't sound too serious to me. Well, it's, it's, a, it's the kind of change that generally is associated with symptoms. It usually annoys the, mm -hmm. the, the, the man who has it. Um, it, is, uh, it can be associated if you obstruct the bladder and interfere with how well the bladder empties. If, as the bladder backs up, the kidney can also back up. So you can influence your kidney function with this, this process. I don't mean to make it sound as if this is insignificant. So it cannot be ignored. No. It shouldn't be ignored. The other problem that you have, which is certainly um, being much more publicized now, is cancer of the prostate, which is um, a bit of a different, a different animal because the, the age problems in, in cancer of the prostate are becoming more and more defined. It historically has been, been said that if you are checked annually or semi-annually over the age of 50, you probably are safe. That probably is not quite true. If you have a, I think it's pretty uh, well established now. If you have a family history of cancer of the prostate, so that your, the vertical line in your family has, has cancer of the prostate, or if you are black, this is not a, uh, a non-discriminatory disease. This is a disease that is much more common in black men. Mm -hmm. You really should be checked after the age of 40. Okay. Uh, again, this, the, the statistics are startling and frightening um, when we talk about cancer of the prostate. 200,000 men will be diagnosed this year. 38,000 will die. I read something just recently that um, a third of all the men over the age of 50 have some cancer cells in their prostate? A third of the men over the age of 50? That's true. And it's actually, the statistics are probably worse than that. If you do autopsy studies on men killed in auto accidents, and you look at 55-year-olds, 65-year-olds, and 75-year-olds, 
that 55 year olds have a cancer rate under the microscope without any symptoms, without any other medical history, of 35%. Uh, that's a pretty impressive number. And if you look at the 75 year olds, they're about 60%. This is a very special and a very important program uh, we're presenting tonight. We're talking about prostate disease, uh, enlargement of the prostate, prostate cancer. Our phone number is 683-1600. Our guest is Dr. James McKay, a urologist from Mercy Hospital. We're gonna take a short break and we're gonna be back to take your phone calls. We have a confession to make. Did Mrs. Bowles have anything to do with the murder? No, I did it alone. But we have the best lawyer in the country on retainer. But I didn't kill him. I didn't. Mr. Crinston killed him. All I did was call down to the car. Tell him, Mr. Crinston, please tell him. We confess Perry Mason is back in prime time, but they forced us to do it. They goaded us on until we couldn't stand it anymore. I killed him. I did it because I loved Martha. Yes, Perry Mason is back, often with familiar faces from other shows. Well, if this gets into the newspapers... It will. It's TV's classic courtroom drama, Perry Mason, weeknights at 10 on classic WQEX. Ralph Cramden on self-realization. Want to know why, Alice? I'll tell you why. It's because I have a big mouth! He's a bigger man for admitting it. A very big man. Ralph has so much to teach us. The classic comedy of TV's golden age, The Honeymooners, weeknights at 11 on classic WQEX. to clear up a little confusion, answered a couple of questions, but if we haven't, don't worry, there's plenty of time left in the show. The doctor will be here with us for another probably 45 minutes. The phone number is 683-1600. A lot of men hesitate, they're afraid to go to the doctor to ask questions. Now this was not the case with Hall of Famer, great football star, Johnny Unitas. <laughs> Johnny U. That's all you need to say. Every football fan, young and old, will know exactly who you're talking about. No, there's no mistake in old number 19. From his hunched shoulders and perfect spirals to his signature crew cut and high top shoes, Johnny Unitas was the ultimate quarterback. Namath, Tarkenton, Greasy, Dawson. Sure, all marvelous players in their own right. But Unitas was named the greatest player in pro football's first 50 years. He was the king, a leader, a champion, and a hero to many. But you know what? Even though he truly is and was all of those things, he's also just a guy. In fact, he's just a guy from Pittsburgh. And nothing highlights this realization more than knowing that Johnny Unitas has been battling a problem. A common problem to men over 50 but a problem that is being brought to light by the unselfishness of a superstar. Hall of Famer Johnny Unitas, on behalf of the Partnership for Prostate Health, is spreading the word that he has benign prostate enlargement. His message is very clear. One in four men over 50 have bothersome urinary symptoms and are unaware that these symptoms may be associated with prostate disease. We're losing too many men because guys uh, are big macho, they don't think, hey, I don't have to see a doctor. It's a normal aging process. Well, sure, it's a normal aging process, but you still go see a doctor. <laughs> Being 18 years in football, you know, I'm on a uh, first-name basis with most doctors in Baltimore area, and uh, uh, you talk to doctors and trainers, and if things bother you, you tell them, hey, my shoulder's bothering me, my left elbow bothers me. So, you know, it's pretty easy for me to talk to doctors. I think a lot of men, get embarrassed by having to want to go talk to a doctor about a prostate. You know, first of all, they may have a fear that what is a doctor going to tell me? Maybe uh, something I don't want to hear. But if they open up, they go see their doctor, tell the doctor what's bothering them. That's the only way they're going to get something done. He's, he's the big guy. He's going to tell you what, what you really need to have. 
and uh, together you can resolve the problems. So, how do you know if you're having a problem? Well, the most common symptom is a change in your normal urinary routines, frequency, or flow. Normally, I'm a very sound sleeper, and over the last year and a half, I've been getting up two to three times every night to relieve myself, and this is out of the ordinary. So, I was concerned about it, my wife was concerned about it, and what we really did is to get together and decide, hey, I'm going to see a doctor. Teaming with Johnny to get the message out here in Pittsburgh is Dr. Frank Costa, director of the Urology Institute of Pittsburgh. I think that it's very effective and Johnny should be complimented that he's actually come out and talked about his problem. Johnny Unitas isn't embarrassed to talk about the fact that he has a prostate problem. I think that people that uh, listen to him should examine themselves and see if they have a problem with changing their symptoms and their urinary pattern. That They should not feel embarrassed to go to a physician or a urologist to get an examination to be evaluated and to see if, in fact, they need any further testing or treatment. Well, there you hear it from Johnny Yu himself. He's talking to all you big macho guys out there and saying, hey, if you have a question, ask it. And this is a good opportunity tonight because we got the big guy. Did you notice Johnny Unitas calls you doctors the big guys? We have Johnny Unitas. We've had uh, General Schwarzkopf, Robert Goulet. A lot of prominent people have come forth and, and they've disclosed the fact that they do have prostate disease. This has um, really dramatically increased public awareness and uh, it, it's helping, isn't it, doctor? I think it is. The, the, um, the National Prostatic Awareness Week uh, has been a, a, a big uh, positive effect as well. The, the tendency here, I think, I, I think it is true that men shy away from this kind of thing, but I think it's also true that there's no cultural support for that. Um, women are in, in pediatric offices, they've been in gynecology and obstetrical offices. Um, I'll bet you the average 50-year-old guy, unless he's had an injury, Mm -hmm. uh, has not really been in a medical office. It's a real big event going into a medical office for him. Okay, now a lot of our viewers out there are probably wondering what's in store for them when they do call the urologist and make the appointment and discuss their symptoms. What kind of exam do you do? Is it painful? Tell us about it. I think that generally it's annoying, but I don't think it's a painful exam. It, when you're, when you're doing a, uh, an exam for, for prostatic disease in an adult male, what you're interested in is, is the, the quality of the urine, uh, how his physical examination is, including the prostate exam, which involves a, a digital rectal exam. Um, and then you can get more sophisticated, uh, depending upon what you find and what the symptoms are like. You can, um, you can measure urinary flow, for example. Uh, you can measure how well the bladder contracts and how well it, it generates flow. Uh, you can actually look at the, at the prostate and look at the bladder. Uh, the instruments, I think, historically have been pretty rough. I think they've really required some cooperation on the part of the patient. The instruments now are getting really good. Uh, the new fiber optics, flexible instruments. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I think that for a man who has had experience with... pediatric instruments. How about that? Well, <laughs> you, they look like pediatric instruments used to look. <laughs> <laughs> So it's not as bad as it used to be. It's I don't think there's any question. Most of the fellows who've had experience with the old and the new world <laughs> would say that uh, things have improved a lot. Okay, let's go back to the phones. Caller, line eight. You're on the air with Dr. McCaig. Good evening. Uh, doctor, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm curious. Uh, you already answered a lot of questions while you've been talking here that were brought up in my mind about the subject. So if, it, if there's no um, urinary tract uh, performance problems, I mean, I didn't know what other words to use there. So there's nothing manifest as far as urinary problem behavior. The actual digital exam, uh, individuals that were less that were less inhibited or whatever, how would what would they look for in a self examination for men that were capable of doing that? In a self exam? Yeah. Jeez, I would not know what to tell you. Okay. Uh, there have been there have been countless efforts to to organize patients in the past to have um, s screening exams. Uh, uh, and it works a lot of the time. Uh, testicular examination, for example, really works. Uh, breast exam really works. Um, but there have been other uh, efforts to do internal exams. Uh, there was a, uh, a, a, a time in the, in the 60s and 70s uh, where an awful lot of um, gynecological efforts were made to, uh, uh, to have patients diagnose themselves. I, th I think that that has been 
I, th I think that's been done, and I don't think it works. I don't think that, and I don't, th I, there have been efforts to show that it does work, and I don't think those efforts have been okay. successful. So this is not a case where you can do a self-exam. You, you have to go to the doctor's office, have the digital exam. How about the blood test, the PSA test? PSA is, is a, a really important addition to, to prostatic management. Um, again, it's one of those studies that is, is aimed primarily at cancer of the prostate. Mm -hmm. uh, it can be elevated in benign prostatic It's not foolproof. I know I, I saw the, the um, interviews with uh, General Schwarzkopf and his PSAs came back and they were normal and then I think he went further and had the digital exam and that's when the condition was detected. The, um, the statistics nationally are that about 25 to 30 percent of the men who have radical prostatectomies where the entire prostate is removed for cancer have normal PSAs. Mm, scary. Okay, let's go back to the phones. Caller, line seven, you're on the air. Yes, uh, I was, when I thought, you know, your prostate, the first thing I guess to run through most people's mind is the cancer thing, and, and he's been so thorough and definitive in his uh, uh, answers. Uh, I have two questions relating uh, to the prostate. Number one, uh, I know the standard stock answer is uh, most cancers are treatable if they're caught early enough. How virulent is this uh, prostate cancer? Is the kind can it spread to other vital organs? That's number one. And the second question: What diseases uh, are related to the prostate? The short term, because I'm um, 55. When I was 35, I had a an acute inflammation, which he called prostatitis, and treated uh, with drugs and. Uh, this guy is a pleasure to listen to. I'll hang up and listen to you. Well, now. thank you. Two good questions. Two Go good, to it, doctor. Two good questions. Um, the, the, as, as far as the contributing effects, um, that is a real tough question. I don't think that there is any good evidence that the infections that you get, the problems that you have with young men, uh, are reflected down the line uh, to older age that predispose you to uh, uh, to cancer of the prostate. Um, I don't think there have been good uh, associations shown, so that I would be confident about that. Um, I think the um, there has actually been good evidence that it is not. So I would be I would be pretty content with that. Early detection, he wanted to know if how important that is and does this disease metastasize quickly and what other organs would be involved? That's a really, in, in modern urology, that's almost a profound question. The history of prostatic cancer has been such that it has gone through a change in how medical people look at it. There was a time where it was thought that the only prostatic cancer you could cure was the cancer that wouldn't hurt you. There have been good studies done in an effort to show the natural course of prostatic cancer, and it does have a peculiar quality to it. If you look at how a prostatic cancer increases in cell number and size, when the cancer of the prostate first starts, it tends to double in size about every two years. That's slow when you compare it to other cancers that are uh, a problem in our society. When you start seeing the disease get aggressive, when it starts to hurt the man who has it, the disease changes. It is now doubling in size every three months. So that you're really talking about a disease that undergoes an evolution. And while no one can tell you when that evolution turns, when that, that, that disease kicks into its, its life-threatening phase, it inherently has a quality about it that makes it susceptible to being found early and cured. So I think that maybe in, it, it may turn out to be the, a classic example of where early detection prevents problems down the line. Doctor, is there only one strain of prostatic cancer? Uh, actually, no, but I think from a practical viewpoint, it, 
I, I think they should, they're probably, from a practical viewpoint, should be thought of as one. Okay, we have a lot of other questions. Uh, questions concerning treatment, uh, surgery, uh, impotence, incontinence, all of those things. And we want to take more of your questions, 683-1600. We're going to pause briefly and we're going to return with Dr. James McKay. Bit limited. On Mary Lou, teenage stalkers. On Sally, sloppy teenagers. And on Maury, teenagers jealous of their mother's good looks. That same day, though, Charlie Rose talked with actor director Kenneth Branagh about his latest film, Frankenstein, and the notion of the mad scientist. Uh, a parallel that we used was with Oppenheimer and Einstein, who described the process of trying to solve the equation of splitting the atom as so exciting as to blind them completely to the consequences of what that weapon the could sheer produce. walking that mountain, walking to the top of that mountain and yeah. conquering it. It's so thrilling. It's so thrilling to think that, you know, you've done what nobody else has done before. Then, as Victor Frankenstein finds, when, yes, if he could just have the formula written down, that would be fine, but he, but not, he doesn't just have that. He has a living, breathing being who in his hands, he's produced as rather grotesque because he's put him together from yeah. bits of other human beings and is now utterly dependent on him. And it's shocking. He hadn't bargained on that one. He had Fascinating guest like a child. with something to say. So take out the trash for a real talk show. Charlie Rose, weekday mornings at 9, here on WQEF. And thus, our saga draws to a close. Upstairs, Downstairs concludes with the social event of the season the wedding of Robert and Georgina, and what happens to Hudson and Mrs. Bridges, Richard and Virginia, even Eaton Place itself. Look for the final chapter, Friday afternoon at four. and uh, talking about prostate disease tonight, my guest is Dr. James McKaig, a urologist at Mercy Hospital. And Doctor, we've been talking about two different things. We've been talking about prostate enlargement and we've been talking about prostate cancer. These are two separate conditions. Does a prostate enlargement, is this a precancerous condition? That's a really important question and the answer is no. There has been a, uh, a difficult it's a difficult problem separa separating out the threads because both benign enlargement of the, of the prostate and malignant enlargement of the prostate are both to some degree dependent upon hormones. They are both aggravated or increased in their activity by age mm -hmm. so that you could look at these two associations and make the assumption, well, gee, if you've got prostatic enlargement today, you're bound to have prostatic cancer tomorrow. Uh, and that really is not the case. There is not a good connection between the two, uh, aside from their their origins being similar and their age patterns being similar. But there's not a cause and effect relationship. Doctor, programs like this, uh, prominent people like Johnny Unitas and Schwarzkopf and Goulet coming forth and telling their stories are, are really bringing more people into the urologist's office. What is the reaction? You've done the exam, you've made the diagnosis. What is the reaction of the typical man when you tell him that he has prostate enlargement? Does he understand what you're talking about? I think generally not. Um, if, the, if the office visit is stimulated by a lot of symptoms, he usually is happy. He goes, oh, that's <laughs> great. I thought maybe it was something more serious. Yes. Right, okay. Uh, if, if he has uh, been picked up uh, for another reason, if he has, for example, some, if he has bladder stones, if he has a uh, problem with his kidney function, mm -hmm. if he was found on a routine physical to have an enlarged prostate, if there's, any, if there's a question about the nature of the gland, uh, and he is sent up to my office and I examine him and he has benign prostatic hypertrophy, um, I think generally this is a new concept. Um, particularly if he doesn't have a lot of severe symptoms, it may mean very little to him. What does it do to a man's sense of self to know that he's suffering from prostate disease? I think if it's benign, I think that, I, I think that there is a negative thing here. Uh, as, as men become, as they begin to see themselves as part of statistical, the statistical world, I think most fellows are, are without a problem, without any symptoms, without a diagnosis, 
uh, or relatively free, I think once you get a diagnosis, you're a different guy. Well, I would assume that one of the first questions uh, a man might ask you is, Doctor, does, does this mean that I might, down the road, suffer from impotence? Is there any connection between I prostate think... enlargement, prostate cancer? I mean, I, I'm sure that when we get into a, a, a discussion on, on surgery as a treatment, that becomes a real question. I think that there is, is so much publicity about impotence. Um, there is... Uh... Uh, it is such a it's a great topic to, for for for, for another whole program, for, right? You know, and it gets people's attention, and they're interested. Uh, I think that that is always a lurking problem. I don't think, in my experience, that it is a, a dominant problem. But as soon as you get into therapies, as soon as you start having fellows with symptoms who are who are looking at alternatives, then I think it does become a question. Okay, we're going to go back to our phones, and we have caller line five. You're on the air with Dr. McCaig. Yes. Good evening, Doctor. Hello. Uh, my question uh, concerns the reliability of the PSA test, and I'll go into specifics. Uh, on a routine PSA exam, I had a 4.9. One year later, it was 9.4. So I went to my urologist, and uh, I had a digital exam, followed by a... Uh, a, a a scoping and a uh, slide procedure, <clears throat> which was negative. Did they do an ultrasound and a biopsy? Yes, yes, it was negative. And so we waited six months and we repeated it. It was still negative. The slides came back, the path results were negative. So I went and got a second opinion and they did exactly the same procedures and the results were the same, negative. Then I got another PSA and it was 12.9. So <laughs> I ask, how reliable is the PSA? I have no symptoms. How old are you? 59. I, I'm embarrassed to tell you that I think that that there is a learning curve here for physicians as well uh, as for the audience. And I don't think that we have a complete view of PSA yet. There has been an evolution of this, of this, of, of this test that has started out where it was thought to be virtually diagnostic. As time went by, it was felt that maybe it wasn't diagnostic. Maybe it was dependent upon some other factors. Indeed, it can be dependent upon many factors. PSA is a protein. It is made by the prostate. Every guy who has a prostate has PSA. PSA is made in tremendous amounts by the prostate, but only very little gets into the bloodstream. So that when you measure a fellow's PSA, you are measuring a very small portion of a gigantic pool of PSA that his prostate manufactures every day. What happens is that the abnormality in the PSA is not the fact that he has PSA. It's that it is accessible to the bloodstream. So then the question becomes, why is it accessible to the bloodstream? And the statistics are, that the best chance of explaining that is cancer of the prostate, because presumably what the, pro the, what the cancer is doing is breaking down the blood barriers, breaking down the normal tissue planes between the prostate and the bloodstream, and that is allowing the PSA into the bloodstream. Now, the problem occurs in that there are many other processes that will allow that to occur. For example, a prostatitis where you get a tremendous degree of inflammation, you get a lot of re local reaction, the blood is trying to get into the prostate to solve the infection, the, the, the barrier there is broken down because the tissue is injured, that is going to raise the PSA level. Benign prostatic enlargement, regrettably, raises the PSA level. So that the larger the gland, the more chance to have a, an elevated PSA. What is your advice to this man, doctor? Uh, his, his PSA has tripled. He has had two opinions. Uh, if I recall correctly, his digital exam was negative. 
Does he just wait a while? Does he get another opinion? Does he have the PSA done a fourth time? It's a really hard question because he's done everything right. Okay. The just he, keeps watching it, he's right? He's in an age group where a PSA of that range is a great worry. If you look at the statistics on PSA and, and exams, a man with an elevated PSA under, the, under 10 and a normal physical examination mm -hmm. so that his physical exam is completely normal, he doesn't have any obvious infection, um, his prostate may be a little bit big, but there's no suggestion that he's got a cancer of the prostate. If you do an ultrasound and biopsy on that man, his statistics are, with a normal exam and an elevated PSA less than 10, mm -hmm. his statistics are that he'll have, a pro he'll have a positive biopsy 14 to 17%. That's a lot. Yeah. Well, but he has had a lot of, I think, the correct studies. And, and I, I'm, I'm sure the best advice to that gentleman is to, is to follow his case uh, well, I closely. Well, I think to take his symptoms seriously, and to, or to take his findings seriously, is, is a reasonable one. The, the, the difficulty here is you don't want to discourage him. Doctor, uh, let's go back to the, the phones again. We have a lot of callers out there. Caller line seven, you're on the air. Oh, uh, hello. Hi. My Hi. husband is age 54 and has an enlarged prostate and a PSA of 5.8. Is a biopsy necessary? And if so, is it painful? My husband's very apprehensive about having this done. In his age group, his, pros his PSA is elevated. If his exam is normal, uh, I'm afraid I would recommend that he have an ultrasound and biopsy, yes. Okay, Doctor, what about the, uh, I've seen numerous can I, ask, can I say Should one I? other thing? The, the ultrasound and biopsy of a prostate is an annoying exam. It is more annoying than the physical exam. I don't think that most fellows will tell you that it is as bothersome as they expected. It is certainly not as bothersome as something like a barium enema or a, 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 GI, a lower GI tract study or a proctoscopy or something like that. You're using uh, an instrument that is relatively small and the needle is tiny uh, so that as from a discomfort viewpoint, I would not let that discourage your husband. Okay. Question I had, uh, referring to a lot of newspaper ads I've seen, big, almost full-page ads, uh, for drug therapy that claims to shrink the prostate. Does this work? Is there a little pill you can take that will shrink your prostate? Amazingly enough, there is. <laughs> uh, there are two major therapeutic options for a fellow with benign prostatic enlargement uh, that, that are, are, are medicines. Uh, and they fall into two general classes. One is the alpha blockade group, uh, and the other uh, is Proscar. Uh, alpha blockade is an interesting therapy. Uh, well, they're both interesting therapies. Alpha blockade is a, um, uh, is a medication that interferes with alpha receptors. And there are alpha receptors in three major areas in the body. One is in the sinuses. Uh, the alpha, uh, the alpha stimulators are are sold as a uh, uh, as an anti-sinusitis medication. And if you take them, they'll stimulate the alpha receptors in the prostatic area, and they'll make it more difficult for you to pass your urine. The the, the obverse of that is the alpha blocker, which usually causes a little bit of of runny nose, but decreases the tone of the bladder neck and of the prostatic urethra, the channel that you pass your urine through, so that the alpha blockers relax that channel and make the work for the bladder less. And your nose runs? Well, <laughs> sometimes you have a little bit of irritation there. But it's a very well tolerated medication as a rule, and it really works. Um, the, the medications are primarily sold as antihypertensives, but they're not very good antihypertensives, so that there are not a lot of side effects to them. Okay, what about the Proscar? And Proscar uh, is, a, is a, a fascinating medication as well. Proscar blocks the, the, the breakdown of male hormone to its smaller uh, breakdown products. And in doing so, causes a lack of stimulation of the prostate that causes regression of the prostate gland. And it really works. Uh, statistically, um, it, uh, it causes about a 16% improvement in urinary tract function over about a six to eight month period. The problem is it takes a long time, six to eight months. The, the alpha blockers work right away. Most guys are very, very reluctant to commit themselves to a medication for six to eight months. 
without knowing whether it's going to work. Okay, but once once the the medication has worked, uh, assume, assuming that it does shrink the prostate, then are you off the medication? You're okay, or do you stay on the medication forever? Well, a lot of those studies are are still pending. I think um, I think the studies right now are impressive enough that it's probably worth staying on the medication, and that's what I advise my patients um, to, unless they really don't like taking medication and and there is some evidence that if you stop it in a year you you really have had maximum so results. So you're not seeing any long-term risks and you're not no. seeing any serious side effects. No, it's a very very nice safe medication. Great. Seems okay. To uh, we're going to take another brief time out. We're going to come back and uh, we have one more segment to go so this is your last chance coming up to ask any questions you have about prostate disease. Dr. James McCaig in the studio, 683-1600. We'll be right back. Hello, I'm Norma Zimmer, your host this week on The Lawrence Welk Show. Here are some highlights. Let us praise God together. Saturday at 7, underwritten on W2EX by Canterbury Place. Hello, I'm Consuelo Mack. Join me and the rest of the Wall Street Journal report team for the latest business, financial, and political news that you need to know to manage your career and your investments. We'll bring the worldwide resources of the Wall Street Journal into your home every Monday night, prime time at 8 o'clock, right here on WQEX 16. Welcome back. I'm Eleanor Shano and my guest, Dr. James McCaig. Our phone number is 683-1600. Doctor, we've been talking about medication. We've been talking about, um, well, uh, other th forms of treatment. What are some other options? Well, there, there are a number of, of, of options. Some of them are fascinating. There are a lot of experimental options out there that are sort of, a, I, I think, an eventually proved to be interesting and, and, and effective. Um, there, are, uh, there are some mechanical options. Um, uh, there are, are struts that can be placed in the, in, in the channel uh, that the prostate surrounds that will actually strut the, the, uh, the prostatic channel open. There are, and of course, there, there are surgical interventions. Okay, surgery, um, only prescribed in cases of uh, prostate cancer? Well, you can... I mean, that, you has can to be, that has to be the last resort, right? No, I wouldn't say that at all. I'd say just the opposite. If you can, if you qualify to have your prostate out and you have cancer of the prostate, um, I think that depending upon your age, you ought to take that option. Um, the let me break this down to the the benign and the malignant. The the benign prostatic hypertrophy is in essence a mechanical problem. Mm -hmm. the, the the bladder is obstructed from prostatic enlargement and the, the surgical solution is mechanical. Uh, the instruments that are available allowed you to slide into that channel and actually shave the prostate down, mm -hmm. sort of like coring the inner part of an apple, mm -hmm. uh, to improve and open that channel right. to allow right. the, the urine to flow more easily and to, and to decrease okay. the work that's required of the bladder. That is a surgical procedure, a surgical but, but procedure. a relatively simple one. And a pretty straightforward one, and one that is, has improved dramatically with, with some of the new uh, uh, techniques that are available. The, the surgery for, for malignant prostatic disease is, is much, much more involved. Uh, it involves making an incision in the abdomen, dissecting down over the bladder, usually removing the lymph nodes to make certain that your disease is as best you can see uh, limited to the prostate, and then removing the prostate in total, uh, and re reconnecting the bladder to the channel you pass your urine through, through the space that's been left by the prostatic removal. That's, okay. that's a significant surgical procedure. What about the, the psychological effect, again, the man's sense of self after he has had prostate surgery for a malignant condition? I, th I think that the solutions are pretty rough for, 
particularly for young men who, who are really the ideal candidates for that kind of surgery. Um, I mean, I'm sure their concern is impotence. Does it, does, it, does it necessarily follow? Well, if you look at the statistics that are available, uh, probably 30 to 50 percent of men will lose their sexual function after that surgery. Um, the, uh, the technique that has been developed was developed in Johns, was developed in Johns Hopkins. Um, it is an adaptation uh, to a, a procedure that has been in existence for 30 or 40 years. Um, the, the results have gradually improved as our understanding of, of the complications has, has improved. Um, certainly a 50% impotence rate in a 50-year-old age group is not a, is, is not a, a very uh, uh, pleasant complication rate. But at the same time, this is a problem that generally there, are, there are, are alternatives to. And I think that if the patient understands the, the implications of his, of his getting better from this disease and the, the medical options uh, to his, uh, his uh, potential sexual dysfunction, I think most fellows will we'll do opt, that trade. We'll, 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 we'll opt to, to, for, for survival. Uh, let's go back to the phones. Uh, caller, line eight, you're on the air. Hello. Hi. Go ahead. Hello. You're on the air. Yeah, uh, uh, doctor. I uh, I'm in, I'm 66 years old. I uh, I had a colostomy done December 28th of 1988, and I did notice a change in my urinary function. Uh, I get the I, I get a, a scope done every year, a, a colonoscopy every year, and it always comes up negative. But I noticed that uh, uh, I do have uh, a, a little bit of disorder on my urinary function. What, uh, what would you recommend to me? Well, you get some good questions here, you know. Very intelligent viewers, Doctor. <laughs> the, the way to think of problems emptying your bladder is to think of the bladder as a pump and a reservoir and to think of the outflow tract as a, as a resistant tube. If you're having trouble emptying your bladder, it could be because you have a high amount of resistance to urine flow from, the, from prostatic enlargement. You're certainly in the right age group, and that would make some sense. The other possibility is that you're having a problem primarily contracting your bladder muscle. After surgery in the pelvis, sometimes the nerves are interfered with, and the, the nerves that, that provide uh, a stimulus to, to good bladder muscle contraction. And when those, when those fibers are interrupted, sometimes from a disease process, sometimes from surgery, what happens is that you, can, you decrease your urine flow, not because the channel is particularly dramatically enlarged, but because you can't generate the voiding pressures necessary from the bladder muscle. So your concern there would really be twofold, whether or not your bladder muscle is, is capable of generating good voiding pressures and whether or not your channel is obstructed enough. It could be a mixture of the two. Okay, we are going question. to be running out of time very shortly, and we want to take as many of, as your, of your calls as possible. Caller, line seven, you're on the air. Hello, doctor. Hello. I uh, have Crohn's disease, and, and the past 15 years I've had two bowel resections. What concerns and what precautions should I have and take uh, regarding prostate cancer? How old are you, sir? 46. Is there, and do you have a family history? No. You're white or black? White. I think that the, um, I think your risks are relatively flat. Uh, in some ways, the fact that you're going to be examined so regularly uh, may give you an advantage. Uh, I would, I think I would treat myself if I were you as, as a, as a an otherwise healthy 47 year old. I think I probably would start investigating myself when I was 50. Okay, doctor, uh, give us some just some general guidelines. Um, man over the age of 50, every man out there in our viewing audience tonight over the age of 50 should have a routine prostate exam, right? I would, I think that every every man over the age of 50 should have a routine. PSA and a and routine, digital? a routine physical exam, and a routine digital, digital exam, exam. Right? Okay. Uh, and 
um, if you have a family history, if you're black, then I would move that up to 40. Okay, so um, I guess the, the word is out. I mean, if you're over the age of 40 and you are black, you need a routine exam, uh, digital and PSA, um, otherwise over the age of 50. Do we have time for one quick phone call? Caller line six, you're on the air. Yeah, hi, doctor. Hello. Anyway, what I'm wondering is, uh, does it really matter how much fluid in general you drink, uh, how your prostate acts? I know uh, the more I drink, it seems to be the easier uh, it is to have the flow there. <sighs> That's another hard question. There is a, um, there is some evidence that that your, fu that your function will be better with good fluid intake and good activity, f good physical activity. Um, but I can't tell you that fluid intake in itself will protect you. It will not. This, this drug, um, Proskar, you were talking about two drugs. Are there any drugs out there that will prevent prostate en enlargement? Well, if you take Proskar earlier enough, it will. Okay, so then why not? Well, it is one of the big questions that it's walking around out there. Um, if, if the drug will indeed interfere with prostatic enlargement, um, there is a reasonable argument that the fellows in that age group, 30 to 50, mm -hmm. should be the ones to take the medication and not the 60-year-old. Doctor, is it true that the National Institute of Health, uh, well, th these are some figures that, uh, that I picked up, they say that $200 million was spent on, on breast cancer research, and at the same time, only $36 million to support uh, research for prostate cancer. Does, does that disturb you a great deal? Well, I think, you're, I, th I think that there are a number of factors involved here. One is that there is clearly a political activism involved in some, uh, in some illnesses, and if you are well organized, um, you will do better uh, with regard to grants and, and, and the like. The second thing is I think that cancer of the prostate was really thought of as an older man's disease. Mm -hmm. um, I think what's going to happen in the next years is it's going to be seen as, uh, as the, the, uh, the, the average 55-year-old man who has a risk for this disease thinks he's hitting stride. He doesn't think of himself as an old man. Mm -hmm. um, so that I think that those things are probably going to change. I think it's going to be difficult to have great success in the near future with this because as, as the contraction in medical care occurs, and I think it will, um, the first thing that will go is research. Okay, doctor, you have 30 seconds to look into that camera and talk to all those men out there. And if you want to repeat some of those statistics, you're allowed to scare them right now to make sure that they go and get that examination. Well, I wouldn't, I, I, I would not try to scare anybody. I think that the real point here is that for the first time in the history of man, we have uh, a blood test, a physical examination, and some procedures that are, are uh, uh, uplifting, uh, that give us a chance to, to have insight into, into disease processes that we never had access to before. Uh, and I'd take advantage of them. I think that that is a sensible thing. If you think of 35% of 55-year-olds uh, having cancer cells in their prostate, that's a lot of people. And they're healthy men. Without Dr. James McCaig, urologist at Mercy Hospital, thank you so much for thank an enlightening hour. Next week, change of pace, we're going to have comedian Don Brockett right here on AgeWise Weekly. Hope you'll join us then. Remember, the good years start right here.